we're going to start by very quickly jumping back at the four rules for significant figures. Make sure we review those again. Um, like I said, these are significant. Yeah, sig figs. You taught Mrs. Baker how to do sig figs? Okay, I'll go home and test her and see how, how well you are, yeah, what kind of instructors you all are then. So, Bren. Da -da -da -da. Okay, real quickly, go back over some sig fig things. The four rules for determining the sig figs. What's the first one? If you can, without your notes, just for yourself. Yes, ma'am. Yep, you're right. So, first, all non zero digits are significant. So, if it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, they're significant. I would encourage you to write the number out and underline everything that you determine is significant. Cross out everything you know is insignificant. And then make sure before you make your final determination that everything is either underlined or crossed out. Okay, so all non-zero digits are significant. Second, zeros to the left of the first non-zero digit are not significant. So any leading zeros before your first one, two, three, four, five, and so on, any leading zeros are not significant. So you can go through and just cross those out. They will not be significant. Then third, the zeros between anything that you've already determined are significant figures, is significant, okay? Three of these four rules are determining what is significant. Only one of them is telling you what is not significant, okay? What's the last one, ma'am? Uh, like Look to the right of the decimal point, trailing zeros at the very end, any zeros at the end they are significant, okay? Remember, they have to be to the right of the decimal, and they have to be no other non-zeros after them. Now, what's gonna happen, I told you, I encouraged you that once you're done going through all four of those rules, either crossing out or underlining, go back real quickly and see if there are any zeros remaining, or any, any numbers remaining, but typically what'll happen is there'll be zeros, which before you did not think were significant, but because of trailing zeros, they become significant, all right? So look back at your answer, and then if you were to go through with anything that's not designated as significant or insignificant, go from top to bottom again and just real quickly apply the rules again. What's generally going to happen is you're going to find out that there are zeros, excuse me, where is it at? You're going to find zeros that are between significant figures that you, don't, you haven't made a decision on in the middle somewhere. Those will be significant. It'll be obvious when you start doing these, but for right now, just apply all the rules again, specifically looking for digits which were between significance that you haven't made a decision on and then determine whether or not they're significant or not, how many are total. So we did the on your own 1-12 or 1.12 together. Real quickly, let's just come up with quick answers in our head, quickly trying to apply the rules. Significant figures, how many are there? There are five, right? Non, or excuse me, non-zero, so there's one, two, three, those three are significant. The trailing zero is significant. This zero is between significant figures. It's significant, so there are five. How many? Just give a number out loud. Two. Leading zeros are not significant, remember? So everything up to here is not significant because this is the first non-zero digit. Trailing zeros are significant, so there are two. How precise is this measurement? To what position of precision? This is the ones place, the tenths, the hundreds, the thousands, the ten thousandths. So that measurement is precise to the ten thousandths place. How many sig figs? Six, Six right. You've got three non-zeros, you've got no leading zeros, you've got one trailing zero, and you've got two intermediary zeros. Those two zeros are between significant figures, so they become significant. Five. You can see that the zero is embedded between significant figures, right? So it will be significant. One. Why are all those zeros insignificant? They're trailing zeros, aren't they? They're not to the right of the decimal place. Okay. Let's move on then to 
the, the 11th section of the first module, which is scientific notation. The significance of scientific notation. Up to this point, your familiarity with scientific notation through math is probably so that you can write really big numbers very quickly. That's the only way you've really thought about scientific notation, for the most part. And frankly, that's true. That's a very powerful capability that scientific notation gives us. But for us in this class, and for science in general, it also gives us the ability to keep the significance of zeros. And it'll, it should make more sense in a few minutes. We'll give some examples. But remember that. Sig scientific notation pres preserves the precision of measurements by making zeros significant. When we had that last slide up here, let me go back real quickly. 300,000. When you look at that, we said there's only one significant figure in that number. But what if I actually had a device that was more precise and was actually measuring, rather than to the hundred thousandths place, was measuring to the thousandths place? How do I communicate that with my number? See, I don't have a way of doing it with standard notation. However, with scientific notation, I have a way of preserving the significant of trailing zeros that occur before the decimal place. Because remember we said zeros right of the decimal and trailing are significant. But in the last number, zeros before the decimal that are trailing with no significant figure at the end are not significant. Well, that's a lot of insignificant zeros. We need to help these zeros out. How do we make them significant if they should be? Because if we have a device that's precise enough to measure to the thousands place, and yet our number is exactly that number, so it looks like it's only measured to the hundred thousands place, we've just wasted a bunch of money on precision. And for a number that communicates to other scientists that this isn't very close, it could be in the ballpark of 300,000, as, as opposed to, no, it's exactly 300,000. We do that with scientific notation. Look at these different numbers I'm going to show you here. 1 times 10 to the second. Hopefully you understand that the shorthand in your mind is probably add zeros that are equal to the exponent of the 10, right? So I'm adding two zeros. That's probably the way you think about it. But look at what's sh being communicated here. In my number, 1 times 10 to the second, that's equal to 100. But the number I have out here, the 1, is in this place in my final number, isn't it? How many significant figures do I have? One. How precise am I? I'm only precise to the hundreds place. But if I write it like this, my number still comes out to be 100, right? But the most precise number I have on this side in scientific notation is here in the what appears to be the tenths place. When I expand that out, it's still equal to 100. But see, the precision of my scientific notation in this place here, which appears to be the tenths place, when I expand it out, my precision here is actually to the tenths place, or excuse me, to the tens place, not the hundreds place. So I'm able to preserve the significance of that zero. That zero becomes significant because in scientific notation, it's a trailing zero behind the decimal point. In standard notation, it's insignificant because it appears like I've just measured something to the nearest 100. And we keep drilling in even farther. Look at this, 1.00. Now, see, when you were rookies at this, like four days ago, 1 and 1.0, 1.00, and I asked you, are they equal? You'd go, yeah, they are. And now you're going, not even close. I mean, they may be the same number, but they're not the same information. There's a lot more information there than what appears. Because here, 1.00, that tells me that this place is significant. And because it's significant, when I expand it out, that place is represented by this place here. And that tells me that I've actually measured it to within 1. Here I've measured it to within 100, to within 10, to within 1. And let's go even one more. This place represents this placement when we expand it out. And so by using 1.000 times 10 squared, or 10 to the second power, 
I'm showing that I'm precise to within one-tenth of my measurement. You see, it's unfortunate, but sometimes you do get something which is exactly measured out, and the final position is a zero. And if you write it out, it appears as if that last zero is insignificant. We maintain the significance of the zeros by using scientific notation. Now, probably the way you learn scientific notation was a process by taking a big number like this. And as I said, you generally know scientific notation's value because it helps you write a big number as a small number, much easier number to do. So if you look at that, and if I were to tell you, for example, that there are 22 zeros there, what is that in scientific notation? Go ahead. 2 times 10 to the 22nd. Because what we would do, you would say, well, hmm, there's no decimal place, but there's an implied decimal all the way over here on the right-hand side. There's an implied decimal there. And I'm going to move my decimal point to the left, right? I'm going to move it to the left. And I'm going to move it to the left 22 places. And since I'm moving it to the left 22 places, that 22 becomes the exponent of my scientific notation, times 10 to the 22nd. If I asked you, how would I write this number? If I wrote that whole number out, and I wrote times 10 to the exponent, what would it be? What is this number written in scientific notation if it's written exactly like that? Or make it simpler. The number 7. How do I write 7 in scientific notation? Wouldn't that be 70? You have to remember that any number raised to the exponent of 0 is, its, is 1, is itself. Okay, So the number 7 in scientific notation would be 7 times 10 to the 0, because I'm not moving a decimal anywhere. And anything raised to the 0 power is 1. So an integer like 7 would be 7 times 10 to the 0. 70 would be 7 times 10 to the 1st. 700, 7 times 10 to the 2nd. So when you see times 10 to the 0, it's just the same as saying times 1. All right, so we move it this way. You see how it's powerful to take a big number, it takes a long time to write it out, but put it in a very quick form. Now if we go the other way, or remember we started about units and I said if you have a, a scale, like you're measuring in meters, and you take the same, the same value and you put it in a smaller unit, like millimeters, if I put it in a smaller unit, the number has to get bigger, right? I need more of the smaller pieces to equal fewer of the larger pieces. So remember here, you're taking something that's very big and you're presenting it as something that looks to be very small. So when you take something big and present it in something very small, you have to multiply it by something very big. You have a very few big pieces to equal the same large number. Okay. So you take something big, you make it look small, you've got to offset the making it small by giving it a big exponent. So large numbers become small numbers with large exponents. The other side of that is true as well. We have a very small number. The decimal point is here, so this is very, very small. I move the decimal to the right. And since I'm moving it to the right, I count how many places I move it to the right. Since I'm taking a very, very small number and making it appear very much larger, I have to put what kind of an exponent? Ma'am? It has to be negative. It has to be small, right? Because negatives are past zero. They get smaller. So right, if I move it 27 places to the right, my exponent has to be a small number, a negative number. In this case, 27 places to the right is what I moved it. Number is 1.67. Now, here's one of the things I want you to notice. On this top number here, how many significant figures are there? One significant figure, right? The two. Everything else, they're zeros, and they're the left of the decimal, and they're trailing. So there's no, just one significant. How many significant figures are here? One. You look to the coefficient here before the times 10 to the whatever. 
How many significant figures? One. There's one here and there's one here. Question, how many significant figures are in this number? Pardon? Hmm? Let's go through it. First, first rule, leading zeros. All zeros before the first non-zero digit are insignificant, which means all of these are insignificant, right? So how many are, are significant? The one, the six, and the seven, the three digits at the end, those are the only three significant figures. Question, how many significant figures are here? Three. And that's the key. You've got to have the same number of significant figures in your scientific notation as were in the original number. Okay. So the basic rules of scientific notation, you're going to put it in the form that places one non-zero digit to the left of the decimal place. So one non-zero digit before. And then write only and all the significant figures before the multiplication sign. You hear that? Any and all. So you'd have to go through, for example, with this number, figure out which ones are significant, come to the conclusion that the last three, the one, six, and seven, are significant. How many is that? That's three. I need to write those three numbers in my answer. So I move it back. That's why all leading zeros are insignificant, because you're not going to have them communicated into that answer. You have to have a one. You're going to convert this to a non-zero digit when you put it into scientific notation. That has to be first. The first non-zero has to be the first number. Okay. And again, they're blue. These are in your book. The two basic rules for scientific notation. So we're going to go through example 16, both parts, A and B, then on your own, 13 and 14. And frankly, these are pretty rapid exercises, so we're just going to do them together. We're going to move through example 16, both parts, and on your own, 13 and 14, right up here on the board. So we have a number, and we're asked to put it in scientific notation. 20,300. First thing I have to do, determine which of those digits are significant. And which ones are significant? Molly. Right. The two the three and the zero that's between them. The trailing zeros are not significant, there's no decimal. So what would, when I write it in scientific notation, my two, zero, and three have to show up. My first non-zero digit that's significant is the two, and the decimal follows directly after that. Then I write every significant digit down, and then I figure out the exponent. In this case, the implied decimal is here. I had to move it one, two, it would be one, two, three, four places to write it in that form. So I have to use the four as my exponent when I write it in base 10 or in scientific notation. Okay. Any questions on that basic idea, this process? This is where I need you to go, okay, I'm struggling, but I get it. I just need to practice it. Or no, not, not working for me. Or why are we wasting our time doing this? We did this in fifth grade. Actually, the stuff we're going to do later, the Fahrenheit and Celsius, I was upstairs talking to Mrs. Um, Vincent, the fourth grade, and they did the same thing last week. So fourth grade did it last week. We'll do it today or tomorrow, or today or Monday. So when you go, this is hard, I'll go, okay, go to the fifth, fourth grade and have them teach it to you. Because they learned a song to memorize the formula. So if you want to go above and beyond, go to the fourth grade and learn the song. That's all, that's all you need to do. Or you can go, but I'm a junior in high school, and this is hard. OK. 10-year-olds are doing it. 16, 17-year-olds, come on, let's go. All right, next one. 3,151,367. Which of those digits are significant? All of them, right. All of them are significant. So all of them are have to, will have to make an appearance in my answer. The decimal point is going to go where? Go ahead and speak out. You guys are a pretty quiet group, so I'm, I'm okay if you just offer answers without the hand for a while. Um, the, the, it's implied to be here right now. What will it look like in scientific notation? After the leading three, right? Because one non-zero digit before the decimal point. So when I convert this to, to scientific notation, the decimal point is going to be right here. 
I'm going to show every one of these digits because every one of them is significant. And right now, let's figure out what will my exponent be? What will the power be to the 10? Well, how far did we have to move the decimal from the implied decimal here to put it in scientific notation? We said it's going to be right here in this place. The three point is going to be 3.151367. So it's got to go one, two, three, four, five, six places, right? We've moved it six places. We made the number smaller by six places. So our exponent has to be larger by six places. We started at zero, right? Now let's count up six. And that's what it looks like in scientific notation. It's written in this form times 10 to the zero. We had to bring it smaller by, by six. We bring this number up by six. 3.151367, we have to write every single digit. Did we save any time? No, because every digit that was in the original has to show up in the answer. But now we have it in a scientific notation and we can use it. And you're gonna find out that scientific notation for math is much simpler than writing the whole thing out. So. 234,000. Hopefully now you're seeing that there are three significant digits. The three, the two, the three, and the four. Trailing zeros are not significant. My answer has to have the two, three, and four in that order in the answer. The decimal goes after the first digit, so it'd be 2.34. I've moved the decimal place one, two, three, four, five places. So I'm taking a large number, representing it as a smaller number. I've brought it in five places. I need to take my times 10 to the zero and raise it five places, so I add five, and I've got 2.34 times 10 to the fifth. Which of those digits are significant? Good. Two, three, four, and the zero. It's a trailing zero. So the two, three, four, and zero are significant. Are any of these zeros significant? No. So our answer is going to be in the form of two point. 340 times 10 to something. To put it in the form 2.340, I have to move the decimal place one, two, three, four, five, six places smaller. So I start with times 10 to the zero and I subtract six from the zero and get 2.340 times 10 to the negative sixth. That zero has to be there because it was significant in my original number. I can't drop it. I can't add more, otherwise I'm adding to my original number. It has to be that number. The significant digits in this number, hopefully you see this now, are the 875, meaning my scientific notation has to be in the form of 8.75 times something. 8.75 times 10 to the I have to move the decimal one, two, three, four places smaller. So times 10 to the zero minus four makes it times 10 to the negative four. 8.75 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now we're going to work the other way. Remember I said scientific notation helps you preserve the significance of the zeros. We're going to see in a few cases here how we lose that when we go from scientific notation back to decimal form. If scientific notation helps us preserve the significance, then moving to the decimal form will cause us to lose the significance. And we'll, and we'll see that in a few cases. So right now, 3.45 times 10 to the negative fifth. What am I going to have to do to write that in decimal form? First thing I do is write down all the, all the digits, right? Three, four, five, they're all significant. We know that. So write them down because they're all going to be significant. They all have to be in your answer. Now I have to move the decimal point. And I have to move it by interpreting what the negative th times 10 to the negative fifth means. Okay. Remember, we did the first example. The negative means in decimal form, the decimal has to move to the left. because I'm ultimately writing it in times 10 to the zero. That's what decimal form is. Think of it as times 10 to the zero. 
So since I'm going from negative 5 to 0, I'm making it bigger, right? I've got to make my number smaller. And I make my number smaller by moving the decimal to the left. So I'm going to write 3.45 and then move the decimal to the left five places. It was represented here, one, two, three, four, five places to the left. It's inappropriate to have just simply decimal 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 4, 5. You have to have a leading 0. Okay? That lets me know that it's less than 1. 0 0.00000345. Decimal 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 4, 5. If I'm looking at that, I'm trying to figure out, is that a period at the end of your last sentence? Is this really where it's supposed to be? It's just confusing. So the proper decimal form is a leading zero. If the number is less than one, it's going to be zero decimal and then the rest of the number. Are we clear on that? Okay. So lead with a zero. Don't lead with a decimal or lead with the appropriate number. But I'm saying if, there, if it's less than one, lead with a zero. From this angle, it's hard to tell between the hour hand and the minute hand. So when I look up there sometimes and stutter, I'm like, whoa. I'm, I'm actually responding to the fact that it feels like I'm completely out of time, which we're doing pretty good, aren't we? I mean, let me check it. 10 through, okay, we've got a lot of time left. Good. Because we've got so much good stuff to cover. This is fun for me, and I enjoy this. So I don't want this to end. I know and some of you feel the same way. Some of you not so much. But hopefully, we'll meet somewhere closer towards the middle, and it'll be at least somewhat enjoyable for everyone. We'll see. But I know I'm weird. I do actually, I actually do like this stuff. So here we go. 2.3410 times 10 to the seventh. I'm going to write every one of those digits down because every one of them is significant because in scientific notation, every digit is significant. All I have to do then is move the decimal. How many places am I going to move it and to which direction? Ma'am? Seven to the right. Seven places to the right. That's correct. But here's the rub. Over on this side, when I see this number on exam, if I said 2.3410 times 10 to the seventh, which of those numbers are significant? Is this significant? The two significant? Yep. Yeah. The three? Yes. The four? Yes. The one? Yes. The zero? Yes. Okay. I now write that out in decimal form over here as 23,410,000. Which digits are significant over there? the 2, 3, 4, and the 1. That 0 that I have underlined on the board lost its significance in decimal form. You see? If I have an equipment that can measure to that place, if I write it in scientific notation, I can preserve that information because that 0 is significant. If, however, I write it decimal form, the, the way they learned in kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, and so on, if I write it in that simple form, I lose the significance of that figure. I've lost information. I've translated it into a form that doesn't preserve the information. I can't pass it along. You know, it's, it's, the information is embedded in the language. These symbols represent the language of math, the language of science. And I've now had to put it in a dialect that loses information. It's like in the Nordic languages, you know, Eskimo languages, for example. We might use the word snow. They may have 37 words that mean snow. For them, it's not simply snow. There's all different kinds of snow. And for us, it might be, hey, this is good, this is good snowball snow. This is good igloo snow. This is slippery, slushy snow. But for them, snow matters in their world, right? They've got lots of different words for snow. When we translate it, it says snow. But in real life, it means something more specific. When I was in Somalia, uh, time doesn't permit for me to give you the whole story, but just suffice it to say that there was an event that happened that I was, I was convinced that, that some men in my group were going to be killed. We were at the Market Square, kind of where the Black Hawk went down. We were there about, this is probably about three months before the Black Hawk went down. I was passing down the sector for patrol over to the Pakistanis. We got in the middle of the marketplace. There was kind of, the, the people kind of closed in on us until the vehicle started to get jostled a little bit. It was a little bit tense. <laughs> and kind of like this weird mo movie moment, I opened up the door, stood up on the runner, running board on the outside, and yelled, Absalam alaykum. The Somalis just quieted down. 
They moved back. We drove out. My driver looks over and goes, Captain Baker, what did you say? And I told them, well, if you look in the Defense Language Institute guide, it says that I just said, hi. Okay. But what they translate as hi literally means in Arabic, may the peace of Allah be upon you. So here is this, you know, this white American presumed Christian, which I am, but they don't, they presume everybody's a Christian because if you're not Muslim, you're Christian in their mind or Jew. You're one of those three. So if, since you're not Muslim, you must be either Christian or Jew. But I stood up and yelled, the peace of Allah be upon you. And they were so shocked to hear this face, this person invoking Allah, that they just moved out of the way. See, when I tell people that Defense Language Institute says what I said was high, it's stripping a lot of the information out of the communication. When I say, the peace of Allah be upon you, oh, well that doesn't translate the way we learn to translate, I know. You lose a lot of the real good stuff through translation. Here, going from scientific notation to decimal form, you're losing information. It's not wrong, you just lost some very useful information. If I said, assalamu alaikum, and you said that means hi, I would go, yeah, that's right, but that's not really all of it. There's more to it than hi. That's why my kids, you know, I learned a little bit of Arabic while I was in Desert Storm in Saudi Arabia. And then when I was over in Somalia, and I learned that Somali is a phonetic Arabic, it finally made sense why I was able to understand people even though they weren't speaking, uh, you know, Arabic, they're speaking Somali. Well, it's phonetically the same. It's kind of like you don't speak Cajun, but if you go down to New Orleans, you can get by a little bit. You can kind of understand what they say, and your ear kind of adapts over time. So in our family, go back and forth, As-salamu alaykum wa alaykum as-salam, kif halik toyib alhamdulillah fi min Allah fi min al-kareem. That's a, hello, hello, how are you? I'm good, goodbye, goodbye. Okay, but that's a standard greeting and goodbye in Arabic. So, in German, wie geht's, danke gut und dir nicht schlecht. You know, he goes back and forth. How do you send this back and forth? When you came in today, and you said about Mali, right? In, in your, your Mal, and I said, Holz Mal. It, says like I'm, it sounds like I'm saying, stop, Molly. No, what I'm actually saying is, stop your jaw from flapping. Okay? <laughs> Information changes in translation. So, the simple way to say, when I translate from scientific notation in decimal form, I sometimes lose some significant information. If you showed me a report and it said your answer is 2.3410 times 10 to the 7th, or you turned it in in a different form and you said your answer is 23,410,000, that's not the same information to me. It means something different. And I know it's subtle now, but hopefully as we go through the course you'll pick up on, hey, you know what, this really is, it really is different. It's not radically different, but it, it, it has pieces of information that it would be nice to know that are lacking because I made a decision to represent it in decimal form instead of scientific notation. 1.89 times 10 to the negative 9th. What am I going to do? I'm going to write 189 in my paper. I'm going to hold a point where the decimal is indicated. And now I'm going to move it how many places in which direction? How many places? Ma'am? Nine places and direction to? To the left. Right. Correct. And if necessary, throw a leading zero on there to preserve the correct form. 3.0 times 10. What's implied if I say times 10 if I don't have an exponent? Mm -mm. It's not implied 0, it's an implied 1. If you see 3.0 times 10, if you saw that in math, what would you do? Well, you go 10 times 3. 0.0 is 30. It's an implied 1. So if there's, no exponent, if there's no exponent written, it's an implied 1. That's why I have to write a 0 if I mean it's supposed to be times 1. But an implied 1 means it's times 10. See the difference? So, okay. Was there a question I saw hang up and down? I can't remember who did that. Oh, part of the reason, too, just for everyone, is I tend not to use names in here as much so that your names don't get on YouTube. I mean, I did have one teacher say they saw the board yesterday on YouTube. Mr. Parker went and wow. checked out yesterday. So, wow. so anyway, 
Oh, let's see, we got any more in here? This is on your own, 113. And it's the same type of thing. This was for you, designed for you to do it on your own. Let's do it rapid format up here, because I think you're getting this. Okay, I'm going to represent this number in scientific notation. What's it going to be? Look at it real quickly. I'll give the answer. So you just do these silently to yourself, and I'll talk through them quickly. Scientific notation. I can see right now that the 2, the 6, the 8, and the 9, and the intermediary 0 are all significant. The trailing 3 don't count. So my answer has to have a 26089 in it. The decimal has to be after the first non-zero digit, which is the 2, between the 2 and the 6. And I've got to move the decimal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 places. It's going to look like a smaller number, therefore my exponent has to be larger by 7, and there we go. It was a 0, I raised it 7, now it's 7. So 2.6089 times 10 to the 7. Second one. I've got leading 1 and 2. And the trailing three are all significant. That, what does that do to the zeros? They're all, They're all significant. So you're not saving any time writing this one down. You've got to write every single, if you were doing it, you have to write every one of them down. Where's the decimal going to be? Between the one and the two. I need one digit, decimal, then the following digits. And I've moved it three, six, nine, ten places. That's why we use little commas. It makes it easy for us to count them up. So three, six, nine, plus one more is ten. So it's 1.2 and everything else times 10 to the 10th. Boom. There we go. Third, the significant digits here, hopefully you see, are the 9, 8, 7, and 0. All the leading zeros are insignificant. So my answer would be 9.870 times 10 to some exponent. And I need to move it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 places, making the number larger, appear larger, so I need to make the decimal the exponent, rather, smaller by 5. I start at 0 and I subtract 5, which gives me 9.870 times 10 to the negative fifth. Again, this is an on your own 1, 3. So the answers to this are in your book. And you can see these same numbers in your book. 0 0.980. The 9, the 8, and the trailing 0 are significant. The leading 0 is not. My answer is going to be 9.80 times 10 to the something. I'm moving the decimal to the right 1 which means I make the exponent smaller by 1, 9.80 times 10 to the negative 1. Now we're going to go back to the decimal form. 3.456 times 10 to the 14th. Every one of those are written down, and I simply move the decimal to the right 14 places. Boof, there we go. One point two three four one times 10 to the 3rd. Write down every place. Move the decimal 3 to the right. There we go. Pretty quick, huh? 3.45 times 10 to the negative fifth. Write down all three digits. Move the decimal to the left five places. And place a leading zero to indicate that it's truly a decimal point. Fourth, 3.10 times 10 to the negative 1. I'm going to write all three of those digits down and move the decimal place one place to the left because it's a negative one and add a leading zero to make it correct form. And the zero remains. Remember, this is zero significant here, so it remains. All right. Shake that one off because we're moving on. The next segment or section in the module, the 12th section, is using significant figures in mathematical problems. OK, so we've learned the significant figures rules, and we're feeling like, I'm, I'm kind of starting to figure this out, OK? But when I start using this information in math, why does it matter? Or what does it matter? And some of your homework, the first homework you did, if you were to do it again for Monday, you would do it differently. Because some of you, you indicated your best understanding of what the right answer should look like. But because of what we've done over the last couple days, your understanding of what should look correct and what is correct should have changed. So we'll, we'll cover this. The rules for using significant figures in math. Here's the deal. OK. These are in blue. They're in your book. But we need to cover them out loud and on video for everybody. When you're adding and subtracting anything, whenever you're doing the mathematical operations of addition and subtraction, your answer 
is to be as precise as the least precise measurement. Okay? Adding and subtracting as precise as the least precise. And that's kind of the way I want you to memorize it. Adding and subtracting precise as the least precise. Adding and subtracting precise as the least precise. Remember, precision is indicated by the place where it's at. Is it in the ones place, the tens place, the tenths place, the hundredths place? Which means if I'm adding two numbers together and one of them is precise to the tens place and the other one is precise to the one thousandths place, and I say that on purpose so you can you know, enunciate it, if one is to the tens and one is to the one thousandths, then your answer can only go to the tens place. That's as precise as you can get. Why? Because that measurement was the least precise. It only was precise to the tens place. Therefore, your final answer can't be any more precise than your least precise. Now, the other rule you've got to remember is for multiplication and division. For multiplication and division, you're going to round your answer to the same number as significant figures as the measure with the fewest sig figs. Okay, so. We've already figured out precision. That has to do with the equipment accuracy. And that has to do with how the number looks in terms of which decimal, which place it ends at. The tens place, the ones place, the tenths place, the hundreds place, and so on. That's precision. You get more precise by spending more money to get better equipment. Multiplying and dividing isn't based upon precision. Multiplying and dividing looks to our significant figures. And what it says is, your answer can only have as many significant figures as the measure, the, the, the things you're multiplying together, the things you're dividing. It can only have, the, it has to have the same significant figures as the measure that has the fewest significant figures. Even if for now you just remember, adding and subtracting is precision, multiplying and dividing is sig figs. Adding and subtracting is precision, it can only be as precise as the least precise. Multiplying and division is sig figs. The answer can only have as many significant figures as the measure with the fewest. What does that look like? Well, in your book on example 7-1, or excuse me, example 1-7, they say you've got this jar with sand in it. And the jar with sand in it has a mass of 546.2075 kilograms. That's the mass of the jar with the sand. And then they tell you that the jar has a mass of 87.61 kilograms. And they ask you, well then, what is the mass of the sand? Notice the notation I used up here. I've used this once before. I want to encourage you to start working this way. If I just said mass and mass and mass, it might get confusing. But when I say the mass of the jar and the sand, okay? What mass is that number? That's both of them together. Oh, I have another piece of information, that I have the mass of the jar. The mass of the jar is equal to a certain number. And I'm asked to find the mass of the sand. Well, the whole is equal to the mass of the parts, right? So if I know how much, the whole, how much mass is in the whole thing, and I subtract how much mass is in part of it, I should be able to figure out what, how much mass is in the other part of it. Well, if you do this work, there's your formula. The mass of the whole minus the mass of the jar is equal to the mass of the sand. That's my structure. As I plug that in, if I use these numbers, 546.2075 kilograms minus 87.61 kilograms equals, and if you're just sitting there punching it on your calculator, your calculator is going to look at you and go, hey, your answer is 458.5975 kilograms. Right? Is that what your calculator said? Yep. Okay. Is that your answer? No, that's not your answer. See, your calculator is not as smart as you are. Your calculator thinks every digit is significant. Every digit of precision can be carried forward. It's not the case. Look at this first number, the mass of the entire system, the mass of the jar and the sand together. 546.2075 kilograms. How precise is that number? Remember, it's addition or subtraction. Here it's subtraction, so we're looking at precision. How precise? To what place? Well, it's the tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths place. That's how precise that first number is. It's precise to the ten thousandths place. The second number, 
it is only precise to the hundredths place. Do you see that? So since this is the ten thousandths place, and this is to the hundredths place, which is the least precise? The least precise is the hundredths place. It's underlined there. So my answer can only go to the hundredths place. Any more than that, I'm lying. I don't have the authority to make that stuff up, okay? My answer, because it's addition or subtraction, can only be as precise as the least precise. In this case, the least precise is my 87.61. It is precise to the hundredths place. Therefore, my answer has to be to the nearest hundredths place. I look at this number, 458.5975. I look to the hundredths place. It's a nine. I look to the right. Is it five or higher? Yes, it is. I round it up. My nine becomes a zero. Oh, that means I need to kick the five up to a six. Is it 458.6? No. Now you just lost precision. It has to be 458.60. Why? Because the least precise factor was to the hundredths place. Your answer has to be to the hundredths place. Example 1.8 is a slight modification of that. I'm sure he didn't. And you know what? I have chapel scale schedule in front of me, which means we've only got a couple more minutes left. So let's, let's do this example real quickly. In 1.8, it's computing the speed of something. We're given a distance of 3.012 miles, and we're given a time of 0 0.430 hours. The question asks, what is the speed? If you can cover 3.012 miles in 0 0.430 hours, how fast are you going? Well, speed is distance divided by time. So if speed is distance divided by time, it's my distance divided by my time, and I've shorthanded that at the end by putting MPH, miles per hour, okay? miles. Miles per hours is MPH, but I needed to do that to fit it on one line on the template. If I just simply do the math and divide 3.012 by 0 0.430, my calculator is going to give me that long monstrosity at the end. However, I'm now an advanced math student in chemistry, right? And so I look at this and go, wait a minute, I'm doing division. Division, Mr. Baker said that has to do with significant figures. Oh, my answer can only have as many significant figures as the factor that has the least number of significant factors. How many significant factors are in that? Four of them. How many are in this? Three. Which is the least? Three. My answer can only go to three sig figs. Therefore, it's 7.00. The next digit, that's a four. I ignore it. And I have to include all the zeros, because if I don't, I've lost information. So my answer is 7.00 miles per hour. It's not 7.0. It's not 7.000. It has to be 7.00. Because the least significant figures were in this portion, 0 0.430 hours, that only has three significant figures. Thank you for your time. Have a good day.